distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Abdurrahman Sadiq, and I am a business student from the Higher Colleges of Technology. Welcome to the Festival of Thinkers, Designing the Future Through Thinking. The theme of the discussion is Leaders of Tomorrow. And to explore this theme, we have with us today key education, business, and government leaders. I would now like to call on the moderator for our panel discussion, Ms. Julie Cart, a Pulitzer Prize-winning Los Angeles Times journalist, to come to the stage and introduce distinguished guests. Ms. Cart. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, I'd like to do it from here. We'd like to be quite informal today, and we're very, very pleased to be with you. These people in front of you have traveled a great distance to be with you, and, and, and many of them traveled quite a lot in their lives to, to, to get where they are. And what we would love is for you to ask a lot of questions and challenge us, and uh, we'd like to hear from you as much as we have to say to you. So I'll introduce the panel, and each they'll just say a little bit about themselves and maybe give you an idea of uh, what you might ask them. And I'll start with Shiv Kemka, who's the vice chairman of the Sun Group India. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. Um, my name is Shiv Kemka. I'm from Delhi, uh, but I've lived around the world. I left India when I was 11, lived for a year in France, then went to school in England, to boarding school. Then I was in the, at college in the US. Uh, then I lived in Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina for three years. Went back to do my MBA in the US. Uh, and after that, moved to Russia and lived in Russia for 20 years and Central Asia, and now just moved back to India. Uh, we are a family business. We are in oil and gas, mining, uh, real estate, and venture capital as a, as a firm, uh, active in 10 countries around the world. We also have a, a family foundation, which is very focused on education, and particularly on the issue of leadership and ethics. And we have about 50,000 children in our program now, between the age of 13 and 18, and we select the best of those children after a rigorous five-year testing program. And the best of those children are sent on full scholarships uh, to any university of their choice around the world. So we now have 30 scholars at mainly Ivy League schools in the U.S. And uh, the program is doing very well. Thank you. Thank you. Sitting next to him is Dr. Talal Abu Ghazela, who's the founder and chairman of the Talal Abu Ghazela organization from Jordan. Do you want me to make a statement or to introduce myself? Oh, it's, uh, I, think, I think you all are uh, very much on, uh, in the knowledge society. So it's much easier for you to go on the web and uh, I'm the easiest name to find. So just search for Talala Boazali and you will uh, know who I am because it's a very complicated story and I don't want to waste the morning talking about Talala Boazali. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> In the middle is Kathleen Martinez Berry. She's from the Dominican Republic. She's an attorney, she's an archaeologist, and she's a diplomat. Well, uh, for me, it's, uh, since I arrived to the Emirates, I think it's thrilling to be here with you. I've been um, having a, a lot of ch challenges in my life. I, I go from one career to another when I have these ideas that came up and I don't want to restrict these ideas to go on. So for me it's a pleasure to be here and to tell you about my experience in all these adventures that I've been through. Since uh, I became a lawyer, I was um, 17 years old and then I continued studying in different uh, areas that made me uh, complete as a human being. And now, uh, nowadays, since five years, I'm in Egypt in an archaeological project searching for Cleopatra and Mark Anthony out of an idea that came out when I was in Dominican Republic. So what I want uh, to be an example of the free thinking that everybody can have and uh, that in life it's very important to follow your dreams and to go when you have an idea to, to search for this, uh, everything that goes in that way to achieve what you want. Thank you. Next is Sabria Tenbirken, who's a co-founder of Braille Without Borders in India. 
Yeah. Um, maybe I can briefly introduce myself as a dreamer. Yes, I am a dreamer, and I am a dreamer since I became blind. And this uh, has a very clear reason because when you become blind, you have ima- you have to imagine everything surrounding you, everything that is not obvious to you, and uh, you get. Uh, to dream or you are actually forced to dream about what you want to do and how you want to envision this world. So um, I dreamt about my future and I decided to uh, leave my uh, home country, Germany, uh, to do something adventurous. So I studied Tibetology and uh, during the studies I found out that there was no braille system for the Tibetan language so I created one. And then I went with this braille system in my backpack. I went to Tibet in 97, and I found out that there was no school for the blind. And since I came there without a sighted person, people believed me, also the government, the Chinese Tibetan government believed me that I could start this school for the blind. But what I, want to, uh, want, uh, what I actually wanted to do, I wanted to create a new concept of blindness. Blindness is very often seen not only in Tibet, actually everywhere else in the world too, blindness is seen as something very terrible. It's the end of the world. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's seen as punishment, as, um, uh, as something that has happened to you, maybe because you did something in your, in your former life. And uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a new concept of blindness, that actually blindness can also be seen as a great chance, as a great opportunity, especially when we are talking about leadership. Later, maybe we can talk about that as well. Um, uh, just very shortly later, uh, I went from Tibet uh, to the south of India, and therefore Brave Without Borders in India. And in India, I started a, um, a school, uh, not a school, it's a training center, it's a hub for visionaries from all over the world, people who are allow themselves to dream and people who want to realize these dreams into social projects and to make the world a better place. Okay, and finally we have Dr. Michael Ortiz, who is the president of the California State Polytechnic University, which is a cluster of very, very um, well-regarded universities in California. Uh, thank you. Uh, my institution in California, I'll start by just giving you a brief description. It's uh, 21,000 students, and we focus on uh, primarily math-based curriculum and, and programs. But uh, in the role as president, I'm frequently cast as the, the leader of the institution, and it's my responsibility then to examine and explore alternative uh, leadership styles uh, and the latest in, in terms of the visions of, le- of leadership And as a result of that, I'm here uh, speaking on this panel, and I believe that there are some new paradigms in terms of leadership, and those are the things that I'll hopefully discuss with you as we move forward. All right. And remember, we're going to get to a section where we hope you all ask a lot of questions, but we'll start out. Shiv, your background is so interesting because uh, you've lived in a lot of different places and a lot of different influences, um, seen leadership and been a leader. Um, would you define leadership by region? Is it, has it presented itself differently to you, or do you think leadership is leadership no matter where you are? Uh, I think leadership is leadership wherever you are. I think the expression of that leadership is perhaps different. The nuances are perhaps different and are connected to the cultures and the roots from which that leadership emerges. So in the U.S., for example, uh, you know, people are much more sort of uh, gung-ho and much more open and much Loud. more... <laughs> Whereas in some cultures, I found the leaders are much more quiet and much more sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, collaborative in a way. And so I think leadership emerges in different ways. But at the end of the day, I think leadership is about, uh, you know, having a vision, putting a team together, having the team believe in what you believe in, and sharing that vision with a group of individuals and actually then moving towards certain goals and objectives. And uh, I think uh, the question, the big question is, not all leaders are the same. You know, Hitler was a leader, Stalin was a leader, Gandhi was a leader, Mandela was a leader. And what differentiates those leaders? It's obvious, but at the same time, how does the education system actually 
stops certain behaviors and allows certain behaviors. It's possible to be a leader without followers. <laughs> it is also. Yeah. Mike, you've had uh, experience both in the classroom and out of the classroom in grooming leaders for tomorrow. Um, is it, talk about age. Uh, some people who have gray hair uh, immediately assume that they're going to be a leader and people will listen to them. And if you're young, uh, no one will listen to you and no one will follow. You, you work with young people and older people, uh, if you don't mind me calling academics older people. Um, how does it play out in terms of age for you? Age is an artificial barrier. And I see eight of the, uh, the barrier that exists between age and, and I think the Sheikh Nahyan yesterday talked about wisdom and that wisdom doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily me uh, measured in years. And I think that's the case. I believe it's a, uh, the, matter, the manner in which you approach the leadership role, which is uh, very important. I have academics that uh, I work with on a daily basis that uh, are very poor leaders with regard to actually getting an idea and listing people to follow them and, and carrying it through to fruition. But I have students at the same time that are outstanding leaders that uh, will champion uh, recycling on the campus and start, in, uh, and start uh, projects that will allow that to happen, that uh, get involved in the political aspects of, of the university as well as the state. And so it really depends on the focus that they have and how they enlist the support for what they're trying to accomplish. And I think that's one of the real keys to the leadership role, is that more and more leadership is a team sport rather than an individual activity. Collaborative. Well, did you want to say something? They've taken your podium, but perhaps you could speak from... From here? Okay. Uh, at Talal Abogazali College of Business, which is one of my hats, uh, as its president. Uh, incidentally, last month we, month we won the prize for the best business school in Asia. Uh, our motto is, this is where the elite become leaders. And uh, our concept is, in pre is preparing our students, graduate students, for leadership. And our approach to this is through the concept of education for citizenship. In other words, we believe that in order to prepare leaders, you don't just give them education. You give them the education that can make them good citizens. And good citizenship comes through education for citizenship and education on citizenship, including civil, civic work and including training them on, on, on what it means to be responsible in corporate social responsibility, in inspiration for loyalty. By the way, citizenship has a meaning in Arabic which is very interesting because we don't say citizenship in Arabic. For those who can speak Arabic, citizenship is al-muwatana. Al-muwatana refers to homeland versus citizenship which refers to city. So in our language, Citizenship means belonging to the homeland and being committed to the homeland. Sabria, you are a person who uh, the world looks at and says, oh, this woman has a disadvantage. She can't see. So you couldn't possibly be a leader. How can we follow someone who doesn't have sight? What do you say to that? Well, um, first of all, I don't think at all that I do have a disadvantage. Uh, if I look at my life as a sighted person and my life as a blind person, I think my life became much, much more interesting. Um, also, I do feel that uh, people who have obvious uh, limitations um, create certain skills or have the possibility or the potential to create certain skills um, that are very, very... Uh, how to say, handy when it comes to leadership. Uh, for example, just um, take blind people. Blind people um, are uh, or have the ability to focus because we are not distracted by Hollywood and Bollywood. Um, we can concentrate on really what matters. We have the possibility or the potential to communicate because this is what we are doing constantly. You know, our ears are the gateway to the world and our mouth is the gateway to, to make ourselves understood. We cannot easily um, work with our hands or our eyes. 
we also do have the big potential to become problem solvers. Because think of a blind person put in a world for the sighted. We constantly, from morning to evening, we have to solve problems. We have to find new ideas. We have to find new ways for, um, for, uh, for things that, that we have to do in life. So why not encouraging blind people to solve problems of other people as well? Um, additionally, and this is sometimes uh, very often forgotten, uh, people, when they think of leadership, and by the way, I have a problem with leadership, maybe we can talk about this, uh, or with the term leadership, we can talk about this uh, at a different point, but um, when people talk about leadership, they very, very often forget one very important skill, that is what uh, Sheep already mentioned, is vision. And I do feel that blind people who are um, constantly depending on their imagination, constantly on inner pictures, on something that they have to create, something that, that, that is not obvious to them, that they don't see right in front of them. Um, those people have also the potential or the ability to create visions, to create something that is in the future. And I do feel that all these qualities Focus, communication, problem solving, and vision are major things for so-called leadership. Well, you, I'll, I'll follow you anywhere. You've made a pretty good case for me. <laughs> Kathleen, you have an interesting story that you might talk about um, how leaders are, are helped along by mentors. We, we learn, we have teachers, but sometimes you need someone or some people in your life to take an interest in you and uh, say, you know, I think, I think I see something. Let me help you. Let me show you how to, let me lead you to being a leader. And I don't know if it works for you to talk about how you, when you uh, took that case, um, as uh, Kathleen was uh, still in law school in the Dominican Republic and required to try criminal cases. And she took on a very, very difficult uh, case. For, and, and an attorney found you through that. If you talk about that, maybe. Well, before we go to, to that that you're asking, I would like to add some, some of what they say about leadership because uh, we've been talking here about, uh, for example, Mr. Talati said about they, they educate leadership, the leaders to become um, innovators. But I believe one of the most important things is the, the ability that we are not giving. There are some skills that we are missing because the leaders of today, they are not going in the right direction. So we need to do some change in order to, to get in the direction that the world needs. And one of those is the education. But not in the sense that we are receiving the education, because first we need to be able, as uh, we've been saying here, the capacity of, uh, to, to speak and in the proper way, but also we need to develop the intellect. And th this requires a change in the whole process of education because the schools nowadays and before, you know, they concentrate in the, the students, they need to memorize everything. But they don't give us the tools to, to understand the concept of what they are teaching. And this is why the students go, goes out there and they don't know anything, they don't have the intellect, they don't know how to think. And this is one of the main things we need to learn. And the, 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 the leaders of the future, beside another qualities, like be uh, innovating in their ideas and also the capacity of dreams. This is it's, it, the school, if you, if you don't write a, a test, exactly how the book says, you are going to fail. And this is, this uh, provide, give you, you know, you have to prepare to, to, to take for granted what the, the teacher says and what the book says and don't give you space for imagination. And this is one of the points I want to add sure. for what they are saying. Why don't we let our educators weigh in? Um, Talal and Mike, I think this is a great point when you to allow people to think and create ideas and, and to have independent thinking, you need to give some space, and that's part of leadership, not to use this word too much, but you have to have the, the courage to do that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe because my background is business, 
and I would like to put some perspective or methodology. What we're talking about now is a process. I would like to look at the objective, the goal. Leaders, leaders for what? And I hear the comments of everybody, leaders for what? Leaders to lead the nation and the world to become a better world. And in order to do that, we need a process of openness, we need the correct education in, in the sense of learning rather than teaching. We need uh, to be in a, a, in a, in a uh, uh, knowledge-based education in a digital world. All of that is understandable. My emphasis is what are we preparing these leaders for? And I want to repeat that. I want to prepare them to be good muwatineen in Arabic, which means citizens in English, in the sense that they have a role, they have a responsibility to serve the country, unlike our leaders now, particularly in the West, and I have to be very, very candid and critical about this, the crisis that we have in the West is because the leaders were not good citizens. All they were doing was to compete, to win the elections by giving promises which they cannot afford and resulted in deficits and, and in, in, in an unsustainable uh, public debt. Therefore, these were not good citizens. It doesn't matter how much knowledgeable you are and what genius and innovative and creative and well, uh, well informed. I want to emphasize that we have to think about how to build an education system which prepares us, as Bill Gates said in one of my panel discussions, I had the privilege of being with Bill Gates, and we talked about the future. He said we've gone through the information age, we are now in the knowledge age, maybe in the next century we will go into the wisdom age, where we will use knowledge for the benefit of humanity, which we are not now. What we need to start to do is to think about learning for the purpose of serving your homeland and the world. Thank you. Mike, this sounds very Socratic. Are you, are you turning out graduates who are learning for learning's sake, or are you uh, a, a training institution to turn out uh, technocrats and business people and doctors? What, what do you do? How, do you bring in the humanities? How do you bring that? Well, I think that uh, we all have a very basic foundation of knowledge that includes the humanities and, and includes the arts. And so I think that that's part of the process we go through. But I would like to add one thing uh, in terms of the, the terms that we're using here with regard to leadership that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's ethics. I think that's what, that's what we're lacking in terms of, uh, you use the term leadership in the West, I'm not sure I would use the term leadership. But uh, anyway, I would say that uh, ethics is a critical piece of that. If we're not ethical about what we're doing, then we're not going to be good citizens. Uh, so I believe that uh, what we try to do is create an environment. In our institution, we have a philosophy of learn by doing, so that we teach theory through application, so that the students that leave our institution and are go, go into the field uh, that they've selected in their discipline, they have already demonstrated the technical skills that are required for the position. But we also go through a process to make sure that they create the ethical and the citizenship skills to go along with it. Right. Hugh, this is something that you'd like to speak to, I'm sure. I'm an American kid. I'm trained. I want to win. I want to be number one. The ends justify the means. I'm rich. Isn't that great? Does it matter how I got there? I won. Does it matter who I stepped on? How do you, how do you imbue that kind of ethic in, in that? Thank you. You've touched all of you on a very critical point when you talk about ethics in leadership and ethics in education. And, uh, you know, we believe, and having thought about this a lot, that actually it's very late when we get to college to start on ethics. Ethics start when a child is three years old, four years old, five years old, by the parenting, first of all. Uh, unfortunately, the media has invaded our homes, and so all kinds of values come into our homes, and unless we have people that are guiding the child, the child's mind, as to perhaps the way they should look at all the data points that are coming into their home. They might think a lot of those things are normal, uh, you know, a lot of the detective things where people are killing everyone and so on. So I think it's extremely important, the custodianship, the guardianship, the guidance of elders and wisdom, uh, which needs to be imbued from a young age. So parenting is the first area that's critical. Number two, the teachers the teachers in the schools at a young age 
not at college. By the time people get to college, I think the ethical construct is already framed. I think it's late. Of course, one can guide always through life. But I think the critical thing is, when they're young, that there is enough guidance uh, at the child's level. So our foundation, as an example, trains the teachers, uh, focuses on ethical constructs, focuses on debate amongst the children about ethics and leadership. And from the age of 13 to 18, we have a very intensive program which we developed at Columbia University School of Education. And we now have, as I said, 50,000 children in our program. We're starting in UAE now. His Highness Sheikh Nahyan bin Mubarak signed an agreement with our foundation and we're starting this program in UAE in November, actually, later this month. And the purpose is to uh, create dialogue and awareness of these issues at a young age and then to identify a young leadership talent that actually has uh, strong ethical foundations and then to give them a chance to lead uh, and to do service in the last two years at high school before they go on into the world and then to guide them through life. So I think it's a big challenge and I think the answers aren't easy. But the only solution I would have is you've got to start very young. You yeah. can't start later in life. Too late by then. Let me ask you all to answer or to respond to this. Um, there are times in, in times of crisis in particular when a leader has to say, we're doing this, no questions, it's got to get done. You, you, there's no time, it's a state of emergency, something has to happen. Most of the time in our lives, we're not in that situation, and a leader sometimes says, let me explain to you why we're doing this, and I'd like feedback, and love to hear what you have to say, and I'll take it into account. Um, but there, there's a, a kind of a range of how collaborative you can be uh, with people who, I guess we'll say, are following you. Or how would you deal with someone like me? I'm a journalist. I don't like to be told what to do. And I question everything. If you say, let's walk out that door, I would say, why don't we take that door? I'm a real pain in the neck. As a leader, how do you respond to that? How do you know the appropriate time to say, this is why we're doing this, and let's all talk about it? versus, uh, no, we're doing this right now, don't ask any questions. How do you, how would you all deal with that? Just go down the line. Me? Go ahead. Okay, well, I, I would say, uh, you know, there's a great author, which I would recommend all of you to read, called Jim Collins, who's written a number of books, Good to Great, Built to Last, and his most recent book. Uh, uh, and he talks about level five leadership. And these leaders come in all shapes and sizes, but there's one thing that unites them, and that is... Uh, a passion for something beyond themselves. And that passion actually unites all kinds of uh, people. And those people can have their own opinions, can do things in very different ways. But the driving passion towards something that is external to themselves is what unites these types of... Uh, creates great leadership. And it's a very interesting uh, way of looking at leadership. From another perspective, I... I served on the Senate of the uh, Kingdom of Jordan and I exercised this sense of responsibility as a senator and I wrote a, do uh, a, a letter to the government and to His Majesty the King saying that unless we do something about the economy we'll find ourselves in the same situation Greece was before it collapsed because Greece or Papandreou refused to accept that he has a problem. And he tried to continue as if everything was great. And there is a moment, and that was very well received, and it was taken upon, and a process of correction started, and I'm now leading a, a, a forum, an economic policies forum, f to propose what restructuring needs to be done in, in regards to the uh, policies of the uh, economic policies of the Kingdom of Jordan, so I, I think that was that's a, an example of when you are you do something in the right in the right attitude and with a positiveness, uh, uh, you get the right response. And I was very critical about the West, uh, but I, I have the same criticism about the Arab world. The same situation in the Arab world where we have all of these. Uh, uh, awakenings, as I would like to call them renaissance rather than spring, because it's not a season, it's, it's a beginning of an awakening. Uh, and I've always uh, had, uh, had, uh, had uh, uh, take offense to the word spring, 
which was uh, which may be very appropriate in the English language, but not in our context. So uh, uh, I think that is a situation where, because the leaders did not realize that they have a problem, corruption, uh, and bad bad treatment, mis mis. Uh, uh, appropriation of resources, etc., etc. You know all the story. So unless you uh, come as a leader at the right time, I say I have a problem, and I want to solve it, and I want my people to put their hands into mine, and we work at it together. Catherine, well, I think one of the most important skills of a leader may have is the capacity of communication effectively, because if, if you cannot convince your own people of what is important because you are the one who has the capacity of see beyond what others cannot see. But it's not only to have the idea, it's also to be able to communicate so that people can understand. Because when you have an idea, when you have a project, usually people don't understand this project, but with your capacity of communication is how you get to the people to understand. Yeah, I have a I have a, a problem with the word um, leadership. Um, I really must say um, uh, I don't I don't want to imagine somebody uh, who who just says okay follow me and everybody follows follows this person. Um, I rather would like to find out if there is something else that that we can um, uh, that we can design or how we can design this this sort of person who creates change. Maybe I would rather like to see this person as a change maker. And then I would totally go with Mike and, and, and Chief and everyone here to say a change maker. What does a change maker need to have? A change maker needs to have passion, as Chief uh, already said. A change maker needs to have ethics, as you said. A change maker needs to have energy. And a change maker needs to have vision, and of course the communication, uh, Kathleen, um, uh, uh, communication uh, skills to um, to provide this vision, these ideas to the society. Um, uh, also, I do feel that a change maker, just to get, go away from the term leadership, sorry to say, but you can just replace it in your head with leadership. But a change maker should also have the guts to provoke. Uh, or to question, uh, question or to challenge the status quo, to challenge traditional harmful ideas and norms. And a change maker has to have the possibilities to give innovative and creative ideas. And then I ask myself, of course, where do we find these change makers? Um, are these old leaders that we have who are uh, causing all these problems, or who are causing these crises, are these the right one in the same position? Should we not rather ask ourselves, even if we are leaders ourselves, and we get our, our world into a crisis, should we rather not start to become a little bit more self-critical and think, did we do everything right? Or can we maybe um, create a new paradigm of leader? Or can we maybe create... Um, or, or find new leaders somewhere else, not in the regular society, not in the mainstream society, but how about finding people, change makers, in the margins of society? For example, um, amongst handicapped people, for example, in developing countries, in post-war countries, in people who have uh, and who are <coughs> experiencing problems day in and day out. And I'm sure that they come with the right initiative, with the intrinsic interest, with the ethics, and with the energy to, uh, to, to change something in their countries for the good of others as well, and not for their only good, um, or their only benefit only. Mike, the question has morphed by the time it's gotten to you, so <laughs> yes. here's, let me put it this way. Um, talk about finding leaders on the margins of society, people who aren't represented diversity of opinion and how that helps uh, us come to conclusions and, and, and make decisions? Uh, I think that's a critical piece. I, I, I agree uh, that we need to find individuals that represent a broad scope of, of people as, as inclusive as we can be in terms of making decisions and, and analyzing situations and issues. I know that on my campus, for example, we're the fifth most diverse campus in the United States with regard to the population that we serve. 
And as a result of that, when you walk into classrooms and you see how each one approaches a problem from a different perspective based upon how things occurred to them in their lifetime, it really creates a, a tremendously enriching exercise to watch resolutions come from that type of uh, interaction. So I think that uh, in looking at how you, how you find leaders on the margin, one thing that, has, that hasn't been mentioned, going back to your initial question, is that you have to establish some level of credibility before, and I think then you need to have the communication skills to say, okay, now that you have identified me as someone that possesses the skills of an individual that you would follow based upon the information that I've heard from you and the things that we have to do, we have to make this change, and this is where we're going. We're not going to rehash whether or not you agree with me at this point because this is what we have to do. You've, you've entrusted me with that decision-making ability up to this point. So the ability as, as a leader to admit, okay, we're going in a different direction. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to hear from you all. Does, does anyone have any questions for the panel? would love to yeah, have you. an interactive exchange. We're all, we're all full of baloney. Tell us we're wrong. <laughs> love to hear it. Or well, maybe you disagree. Absolutely. Right in front. There's a microphone coming. Excuse me. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, having uh, successful leaders anywhere in the world is not easy. Uh, so how you can distinguish that? Uh, 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 for me, uh, leaders is like a gift. Uh, leadership skill is a gift from the God. Nobody can have it. So, uh, how you distinguish a good leadership from those managers who are not capable to do uh, or to make any change in the world? So, uh, do you think that leadership skill it's it's really a gift, or or people can learn from the experience? That's a this is a great question because some people think leaders are born and they can be very young and very compelling, Buddha, <laughs> others, um, and other people uh, think that it's something you gain in stature as you get older and become wise and have experience. Who wants to answer? Jump in, everyone, I think. Hello. Yeah. Like, like everything in life, it's many things. How do you become rich? How do you become healthy? How do you become famous? It's many things at the same time. You must have the basic ability to become and the basic uh, character to become a leader, but you must also have the will to become a leader, which means to work at it, and you must have the luck. You get to be there at the right time for the right thing, and you must also be willing to have a goal for which you work and for which you want, uh, you, uh, which you want to achieve. So I, I don't think any, there is one answer. It's, it's, it's many things at the same time, like in ev everything in life, like a marriage. How do you make a successful marriage? It takes a lot of elements into it. And I think leadership also is the environment, the right education you have, the intellectual, intellectual capability you have, the ability to, to develop it, the, in, the opportunity to develop it, if you go to the, to the best school or you happen to be in a, in a school which is not uh, the best and you could not get the right training. So I think, I think don't go for one single answer. It's many things like everything in life. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I, I do think that a combination is very, very important of, of, of skills, of upbringing, of um, uh, yeah, what you have uh, learned in life. Um, but I also see great leaders in those people who had one point in their life, and I call it a pinching point or maybe the Gandhi moment, one point in their life where they woke up where they said, "Not uh, this. This cannot be continued like this. This cannot be. Uh, this cannot go on like this." Where they have maybe um, s uh, survived something, or where they have seen something, or, um, uh, or observed something directly in front of you. I, I often talk about this Gandhi moment, where where Gandhi was thrown out of the train in. Uh, I think it was in South Africa. He was a lawyer. He had a first-class ticket. He was sitting in the first class, and um, and the conductor uh, came into the first class and and uh, and asked him to leave because he had the wrong skin color. 
And uh, probably this moment gave Gandhi, I, I could imagine that this moment gave Gandhi this creative, little creative sense of not any more like this, that we cannot continue like, uh, like this. this. This creative rage that, um, that brings something, um, uh, something like initiative, something like passion, something like um, intrinsic energy, intrinsic force to change something, not only for one's, uh, one's own kind, but, uh, but really for a community as a whole. So I believe in people who have overcome adversity in their life. Similar case in the United States during the time of segregation between races, a woman named Rosa Parks, who as a black woman was supposed to sit in the back of the bus, not allowed to sit in the front with the white people. She, she got tired of it, and she was tired that day. And she sat down in the first seat she saw, which was in the front, and she was, it, it created uh, not only a great change in our society, which was quite necessary, but it created a leader. She was a quiet, you might say, average woman who suddenly became a symbol for something so much greater than herself. And what was amazing is that she was capable of becoming that leader. She, she understood that maybe this was her calling, however you want to look at it. She, she embraced it and in a very dignified, courageous way became a leader for a, a movement that changed society in such an important way. And she wasn't trained for that, and not particularly well educated, but obviously very capable. And I'm sure there are many other examples uh, we can think of. Anybody else for that? I would just want to add one point, and I think that we want to make sure we don't confuse charisma with leadership, because you can have charisma and be taking people in the wrong direction. So there is a difference between how you motivate them and the direction that you choose. So there is that piece of leadership that needs to be mentioned. Yeah. Some people think Britney Spears is charismatic. I'm not sure she's a leader. But, yeah. I just add one more thing to that. Is that I think, uh, I think leadership qualities can be developed. I believe that. I believe it's about exposure. It's about the difficult situations people face. But I think there is a gift. And I think that gift, at the end of the day, is wisdom. And that wisdom emerges in some individuals more than it does in others. And the wisdom is the ability to see things in a nuanced way. You know, there's the famous story of the, of the father <coughs> sitting in the house and his wife comes to him and complains a lot about the daughter-in-law. And she says, the daughter-in-law did this and did that and that. And the father goes, absolutely, wife, you're absolutely right. Then the daughter-in-law comes the next day and she says, you know, respectfully, father-in-law, you know, my mother-in-law didn't let me do this and didn't let me do that and so on and so forth. He listens patiently for a half an hour, one hour, and then he goes, daughter-in-law, you're absolutely right. And then the grandson is sitting there hearing these two conversations and he says, grandfather, how can both of them be right? They said exactly the opposite thing. And he turns to the grandson and says, grandson, you're absolutely right. <laughs> He's a peacemaker. <laughs> so, so the point is, leadership is about nuances and that wisdom, you know, is greater in some individuals and perhaps that's something that people are born with. Are there other questions? Yes. Right here. Uh, I think about, I have an idea about leadership. Uh, I think, regarding uh, the question I've asked about, uh, which is, uh, is the leader born or is it a skill that can be done? Uh, it might be solved by this normal distribution uh, the statistical normal distribution. I think there are two percent. This, this is a theory that two percent are born leaders. Ninety-eight percent are, uh, or ninety-six percent can be leaders, and two percent cannot be leaders. It might. This might be true. But uh, I think that everybody can be a leader, and it doesn't matter how much uh, uh, talkative you are or how kind of person you are. People, you just as a leader, you have to have a cause a cause, a vision, or something like that. You invite people to follow you, to create this vision, or create this uh, cause. If people accept, then you are a leader, because you create something that you, you, uh, people want, and they will follow you. Then your challenge is to keep them with you. So, uh, like, <laughs> yes, uh, some people created a mess, or something like this, we have a cause, we are fighting terrorism, please go with us. 
and like this, and they are starting cause by fear, maybe it can be fear, it can be hope, it can be everything. And uh, the black woman that uh, said in the picture you mentioned, uh, she, she was a normal lady, maybe very old, and she was just tired, but she started maybe, excuse me, nagging about what, what the, the situation they are. And a lot of people believe in that idea, we, we, should, we should do something. And maybe stronger people than her followed her and uh, maybe uh, led the way. She did not do the, the, anything, she just, uh, she made the first part. And this is leadership. This is what I believe. Thank you. That's, it's very optimistic to think that, that, that you have an idea that everyone can be a leader. I love the idea of that. Um, that's a, it's an interesting thing to pursue that you might be a leader for a moment, that you are, as you say, the spark, and that then sets off the flame, I will continue the metaphor, that, that creates uh, this movement, and, uh, and there are probably many examples of that. Um, how do you, if, if you are uh, in a position of authority, let's say, how do you find out who has the spark? How do you determine who those people are, because it may be not where you're looking. You're not looking in the 2%, you're looking in the 98%. How do you, if you are mentoring, if, if Shiv, like you have a, a place where you're training people, how do you find a, carefully the future leaders? What do you look for? Well, that's, yeah, that's the most difficult question. And I think really it's about creating a fertile environment where in a safe environment, in a protected environment in some ways, where uh, the different nuances of leadership can emerge. And really, in a way, uh, I don't think it's about us necessarily finding those things. It's about that leadership expressing itself in its own way through the person's life. And so our, our job at the Foundation is to allow that leadership talent to flourish and grow. That's what we try to do. And teachers are critical. Being the oldest man in this group, I have the privilege of a history of 75 years uh, on which I can draw to tell stories uh, uh, re relevant to every question. I was invited two years ago here in Dubai by Al Jazeera to receive an award for leadership. And I attended the meeting and I, uh, the, the ceremony and I said I'm here not to receive the award but to tell you I don't think it is appropriate to give me an award while I am alive because I think a leader should be judged after he passes away because until his very last day he may do something wrong to destroy his entire career and so don't prejudge a leader he may be a, a make-up, a false, a false image of a leader. A, a true leader is judged and valued after his death. And that's how I would judge a leader, and that's how I would like to be judged myself. So it's a long-term, consistent set of behaviors, you would say. Kathleen, if, if you're looking at your two children to, to make it personal, what do you see? Do you look for that kind of thing in them? Do you, do you try to create an atmosphere where your daughter and son can uh, develop those kinds of abilities? Well, since um, they were very uh, small, I, I could realize what they, they will be because every person has their own personality. And this personality allowed you to be a kind of leader or to be more shy and not to express this leadership. So uh, you can see since childhood, this is why I agree when they say you, you cannot go to the university to express your leadership. Since you're young, you have this potential that all human beings have, but probably the culture can help to uh, support this potential or to um, not to let this potential to, to grow. Also, the family can help because they are families that are very supportive and they are other families which really uh, are not interested in those things and they, they don't want the kid to, to be um, a leader or they, they, if they're very innovative or creative, 
children, but they stop these children to, 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 to have the ability to think, to have new ideas. So it depends. Not everybody has the same uh, environment. And in the case of my children, for example, I could see from the beginning when they were children, the way they solved their own problems, how they're going to be in their, in their life. And I see one of them will solve more problems than the other. Sometimes he, he, I have to help more because it's not ready. And this is um, what I think as a parent you have also to be aware because it's not only the universities or the schools, it's also the, the parents who have the opportunity to lead your children in the direction you think is the best. Sabria, you've talked about handicapped children being kept at home for fear of, of them being hurt or injured or being out in the world, um, not being able to develop uh, perhaps leadership skills or, or survival skills. Um, it seems a, a yet another disadvantage to put on a child like that. But, uh, what, what's your question? Sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you, we were talking earlier today and you were yeah. talking about children, we'll stick with blind children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their parents are so afraid that uh, the world is a dangerous place for a blind child, that yeah. they, they don't go out in the world, don't develop, certainly don't develop leadership skills, because they, they don't get to test themselves and learn to, to make their way in the world. Yeah, they certainly don't develop um, failure, or they do, don't develop risk-taking skills. And, and this is something that I, I feel is, is very important, not only for blind children, but for, for, uh, for all children. I'm, I'm living in a country now, in India, where um, uh, parents tend to be very, very protective, uh, not only for disabled people. Um, Shiv, maybe you... Uh, I mean, you have not lived in India for a long time, but, but maybe you can... Um, you, you can witnessed this, this as well. And a lot of uh, people in India, they, they are very, very risk averse and, uh, and try to, to keep their, their children out of trouble by um, giving them very clear lines and what to study, and in, uh, especially in Kerala, in the place where I am. People uh, have basically two options, either become an engineer or a doctor. And, um, and there's nothing, uh, nothing more than that. And of course, once uh, people have um, uh, pe uh, children with disabilities, then, it's, um, then this whole protection or this, this sense of, of um, uh, or the need of, uh, of protecting their children is, is get getting even bigger. And this is, of course, for, for a good reason. But um, I don't think it is, um, it is really for the sake of the child. Um, another, uh, another example, or maybe the contrary example, one of my former students, uh, she's blind, she, um, she's a Tibetan, uh, she grew up in a, in, a, uh, in a family with almost only blind people, so the father is blind, the, the siblings are blind, and uh, they were pretty much outcast. So now she studied at our place, and uh, she studied later in England, she studied in, in Switzerland and in, in, uh, in India. And now she started a kindergarten, the first integrative kindergarten in all over China, um, where blind and sighted people learn together. And her biggest uh, 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 children, of course, from three to, to five years old, they learn together. And her biggest goal is to create confident, alert, creative, and critical little thinkers. Um, she's not talking about leadership but she is talking about creative and critical little thinkers. And, uh, and this is something that I like a lot, um, because uh, whether they are leaders or not, as I said, I have a problem with this word, maybe because I'm German. If you translate leader into German, it doesn't sound very nice, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in change maker, initiate, people that take initiatives, people that brings a little bit of spice in this world. And, um, and exactly what she is doing, she is bringing through these kids, through these blind and sighted kids that she's training, she brings a little bit of spice in this world, a little bit of um, very healthy naughtiness. Little children that are able to, yeah, to, to brush against the, the, the grain. And this is something that I would always support. So Mike, this is a, a discussion of fear of failure. You're at the top of your profession, you have a PhD, obviously successful. I wonder if you've learned more from your failures than you have um, 
from your successes? Always. Yeah. Always. The, the failures are, tend to teach you a lot more about what you should and shouldn't be doing, what you did right and what you did wrong. Always uh, failures are very important. But the uh, point I want to make that kind of uh, adds what Sabrina was talking about, and actually what Chev was talking about, was uh, the age at which you can make a difference in, in terms of ethics and, and leadership. One of the things that uh, is typical of our institution is that we have a high population of first-generation students. And so they don't understand what the possibilities are because they've not been ex exposed to that. So you do have pretty much a, uh, an opportunity to shape their beliefs and thoughts because they haven't been in that environment before. So that I do think that there is a lot of learning that can take place, even though it's beyond young childhood, uh, when you have an environment where you've placed you've placed people in an unusual circumstance and provided them with opportunities, guidance, and flexibility to allow them to develop and create uh, a new person based upon the fact they've not had an opportunity. And no one in their family has had the opportunity to share that with them. First generation students being the first person in their family to attend a higher education yes. university. Yeah. Well, we've been joined by the, the former mayor of the District of Columbia, which is the, it's in Washington, D.C. It's, it's the city that doesn't get represented sometimes very much in our country. Um, Adrian Fenty. Adrian, what we've been doing is blabbing quite a bit. We're hoping to get to be a bit more interactive, um, and we're very broadly talking about leadership. And as we introduced everyone, you know, we made little statements about uh, what we wanted to say, but if, if you do that, it might introduce yourself a little bit more to these guys, and they might be in a better position to ask you questions. Uh, okay. uh, first, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I spent uh, the morning coming to school now without it, uh, and I spent uh, way too long on the highway between out without me and the bus. <laughs> as my driver tried to figure out where he was going. So I apologize for that. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I, uh, I served uh, as the mayor of Washington, D.C., and the reason that uh, I'm so involved in education is because our school system in Washington, D.C., unbelievably, uh, was actually one of the nation's worst. And it was um, uh, my responsibility uh, and my honor to try and tackle uh, the education system uh, and make it better for the kids. Uh, through that uh, journey, uh, I probably learned and took on and can discuss um, a lot of different things that are needed to be a leader to turn things around, including uh, making people upset, including um, starting fast and uh, not, uh, not deliberating too much. Um, it's very interesting. I was with uh, Dr. Uh, Mugir of uh, Abu Dhabi Education Council uh, last night, and it's amazing that even in, a, in our two very different uh, countries, so many of the same challenges exist. So I'd be glad to talk about uh, running a city, running a school system, the politics of cities, uh, or just education in general. And thank you all for having me. Well, let me ask you that. Yeah. You were a guy who put people particularly about education. Part of leading is lighting a fire and saying, we've got to get something done, and I don't care if this is unpopular, we're going to have to get it done. What, what, is, it, what is that dynamic to just push people and say, it's got to be done? Well, systems are resistant to change. It seems like a, a cliche, but it's really amazing to watch. Even the little, the smallest amount of change gets people upset because they're comfortable. So in a school system like Washington, D.C., I'll give you a couple examples. In Washington, D.C., uh, when kids enter the high school, less than 50% of them will actually graduate from high school. Uh, that's just one statistic. Um, more than 90% of the kids in eighth grade, these are 13-year-olds, uh, are uh, not where they're supposed to be in math. So these, there's some really aggressive changes that needed to be made. Uh, when you make changes uh, around teacher quality, around principal hiring, uh, around closing schools, as is happening here in, uh, in the UAE, uh, people get very upset. We as a population, both in the UAE and the United States, we have to support leaders 
who want to make changes because there will always be people against them and opposed to the changes. And if you support the opposition, nothing will ever get done. Are there other questions? Uh, I have a question for uh, As someone who studies history, uh, what lessons do, do you believe that uh, the past uh, will uh, give us, uh, can teach us, uh, can teach us about the, the leadership for the future? Well, uh, I believe um, when, for example, a computer has a problem, we have to reset the computer. It means go back to the origin. And I think this is the moment that we are now, because the things that we have done in terms of leadership, they are not the good for the world. We, we are in a mess. So I think we have to go to the past, and that means exactly to, to go to the principles. The, the first that spoke about ethics were the Greeks, and we have to go to the, to the levels where we have to start again with moral because this is the problem, the lack of moral in the, in the leaders that doesn't get the world in the, in the right track. So we have to go to the past because we have learned a lot from there and we have changed. We have changed in the process. The humanity have changed and not, they have not have changed for good because we are following leaders who has lack of moral. And if we don't go back to the past, and we take the, the principles, we are not going to get in a, in a good direction. So I think um, we cannot achieve what we want if we don't go back and, and again start from the beginning with the, the moral and the ethics and all the, the things that uh, the philosophers from the beginning give us. And, and something else that we have to, to think about the greatest leaders of the world, they didn't go to the university, but they gave us the biggest messages and the changes. So we have to see if in the process we are now, not as a country, but as a whole world, we are in the right direction. There was another question right there. Uh, a question for Mrs. Sabri. When, uh, through your work, you have shown that it is possible to overcome uh, disability and inspire others. What do you think is the secret of inspiration in a leadership? <laughs> that's a that's a very um, yeah. I think I have to think about this. Um, so, uh, if I um, if I think of my own um, of, of my own sources of of um, of, of energy, um, I get energy from people who uh, who have overcome challenges um, and who take these challenges and create strength out of these challenges. Um, people who have, for example, survived wars. And they come out not bitter, not angry, not um, not pessimistic, but they come and and say, yes, we have witnessed the most horrific things, but we have done one thing, and this is we have survived, and therefore we can do um, a lot of things, and we can change uh, our country um, to to, uh, to a much much better place. Um, that gives me personally to, to work with these kind of people, to work with these uh, very, very um, strong and positive thinkers, gives me a lot of strength and gives me a lot of uh, inspiration to go on and also to, to uh, develop my own ideas and to develop, uh, develop my own visions. Uh, I do feel that, uh, for example, an adversity helps to get back in life. Also, for example, uh, economic crisis, I think, helps to stand still, to look back, to think about what is happening here, to not just go on like a machine, but to, uh, to just uh, stop a little bit and to say, wait a minute, you know, I, I cannot continue like that. I maybe have to, um, to think in a different direction. I maybe have to uh, create new solutions for old problems or new solutions for new problems. 
not sure if this is answering your question. That's such an excellent question. Let's put it to each of the panelists and let's make it personal. Adrian, what inspired you for leadership? I mean, in terms of either someone you saw or spurred you to become a leader? Yes, very quickly. I believe uh, that part of living is to give back and uh, to contribute to your community. So I wanted to uh, have a job and where I could make my own community better, and that's why I got involved in politics. How did you get there? Who did you see? You, did, you weren't born with that idea. Someone inspired you to come to that conclusion. Sure. Uh, you know, my parents uh, were uh, uh, typical American hippies. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they were. They were very involved in the Vietnam War protests, the uh, women's rights movement, civil rights movement, you name it. So I think a lot of that uh, set in with me, but uh, I am just someone who really believes in public service. Uh, I believe that the homeless, the kids who are abused, uh, kids who are undereducated, those who have health problems need, uh, they are the ones that we're sent here to take care of. I really believe in you know, the, those types of teachings. And I believe that the government it should be measured by how it performs for those who have the least uh, in our societies. And our government in Washington, D.C., to sum up, when I was growing up, was not a well-running government. It did not do well for those people who needed the government. So I wanted to get in and do something about it. Who inspired you? You know, I think, uh, I think I owe a great debt of gratitude to my parents and my teachers. But when I was very young, I had very bad asthma. I was missing almost six months of school in India, which is why I was sent abroad to France for medical treatment. Then my father decided that I should speak English with an English accent rather than a French accent later in life. So he shipped me across the channel. And I ended up at a British boarding school called Eton when I was 13. And uh, you know, when I went there, it was still a very British school. And being an Indian, there was a lot of racism. So I was 13. And uh, the boys in my house, in my year, played a game called Sending Me to Coventry, which I didn't know this game, but basically they don't talk to you. So for six months in my year, when I was 13, none of the boys spoke to me. And they laughed and joked about it and kept saying, you're in Coventry. And I didn't really understand what that meant. Uh, and that spurred me on to realize that, you know, at the end of the day, you have to... I, I came from a country which uh, I felt... Uh, had huge poverty, had huge uh, problems, and had come out of you know several hundred years of colonial rule, and that I had a chance to make a difference, and that if I didn't lead from the front, then you know this would continue. And I remember my revenge was coming first in English at Eton, so I'd always come first in English in the English language, and soon we became good friends with all these boys. And I, I remember a story when I was 18, uh, I was leaving school. And this young boy, whose four generations of his ancestors had ruled India, became my, what they call a fag at Eton. You know, he was the one who was polishing my shoes, hanging up my clothes, and so on. And at the end of the year, he took me aside and said, Shiv, I have to talk to you. It's very important. So I said, Nicholas Shaw, absolutely. And we, he took me aside to the room and he said, Shiv, you know, I used to hate Indians and Pakis, Pakistanis. I used to hate Indians and Pakis when I came to school. This little 13-year-old boy telling me this. But now I only hate Pakis. <laughs> so I was very honored and touched that my leadership at school had made such a difference to open one mind. And so I think it's about the little things, the little adversities along one's life that creates inspiration that you can actually give back. You can actually create change. You can actually help. And I think... I'm always, I always count my blessings that I come from a country where there are huge problems. If I came from Switzerland or from UAE, where everyone's wealthy and everything is fine, it's very difficult to empathize with the rest of the world. Whereas I come from a country where we see poverty, we see disease, we see every year we add 20 million people to our uh, uh, net to our economy. We have to feed them, house them, clothe them, educate them. It's a huge challenge. And so we need to rise to the occasion. Hello. Um, I happen to be a Palestinian refugee and uh, I think that I, owe, I would like to say that I owe it to my enemy, the occupying power, because in 1948 
I was 10 years old. I was thrown out of my country and landed on a shore in Lebanon where I had to decide what I'm going to do with my future. And I decided that the best way is to demonstrate to the world that I deserve to live and I deserve to succeed. And I took the positive attitude of thanking God for the blessing of suffering. And this is, has always been my theme when I speak to students all over the Arab world, and I'll be doing that tomorrow in Bahrain at the uh, Youth Leadership Conference, International Conference in Bahrain. Uh, I'm, the, I'm going to talk to them, and I always do tell my grandchildren, because I have a grandson today who is at Yale University. And uh, so I, I look at you as, as my grandchildren, and not as my children. Uh, I, talk, I talk to them about feeling good about suffering. Suffering inspired me all through my life, not just as a refugee, but also in my business life. I owe it also to my enemies, because they inspired me to be better in order to win it over them. So my whole life journey has been one of blessings of suffering. The, the old expression is living well is the best revenge, but in your case, living is the best revenge. I didn't want you to do that, I guess. And I, and, I, and, 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 and I know I find myself, when I look at my record, and I'd like you to Google me to see this young refugee who was thrown on the shore, what he could do on his own, without the government support, without any father or mother who can provide for anything for him, what he could do in life, you should get an example that you don't need anybody to help you, you don't need anybody to lead you, you can lead yourself and take your future in your hands. Kathleen, who inspired you? Um, well, first of all, because I, I think because I am sitting here, it doesn't mean I am a leader. I feel I am successful in, in the things I have done because I have passion for what I do. And everything I do, I do it because I am convinced of that idea and I feel the passion to achieve something new. And uh, uh, of course, there are always some people that you take as reference. And in this case, uh, for example, one of my, uh, these persons that touched my life are this person who helped me in, in all the process, uh, my father and the mentor I had when I was a lawyer, he was very wise and he gave me knowledge that I couldn't find at university. For example, the first day I was starting working with him, he told me now, I, I was a lawyer, I was just graduating from law school, and I said, I will teach you law now. Now you want to learn, and it was true, because you, sometimes you came out of the university and you have really all this information, and you don't even know what you're going to do with it. And this is why, at the beginning, when you asked me about the mentor, I think it's very important to have someone who can lead you in the right direction, even though you have all the information inside you. But um, what I, what, for me, what really, really important is to have passion of what you do. Because if not, if you're not passionate, you're not going to do it well. So, Mike, to you, as usual, by the time it gets down there, it's a changed question, it but is. maybe I should say who or what inspired you? Well, uh, I think I have to agree with Jeff. I think it was uh, my father was the biggest inspiration I think I had in my life. And, uh, it was because of the, the basic teachings that he, he uh, bestowed on all the family. But the one thing that I always remember, well, actually there's two things that, that I remember. My father was a sheriff of... Uh, Lincoln County, which is the largest county in New Mexico, and he did that for 12 years. And during his last term of office, my uh, cousin had just totaled his eighth car in eight years. So he had uh, demolished his eighth car in eight years. And so we were sitting at the breakfast table, and my father's comment was, you can work your lifetime to build a reputation, but it only takes one night to tear it down. So I remember that, but the one thing he always said was that a man's word is his honor. If you say you're going to do something, do it if it's wrong, i.e. make sure you don't say something that you're not supposed to be doing. But that stuck with me more than anything else, and I think that that's, that has led to what I consider to be 
guiding light and uh, a very key part of my own characteristics, and that is, if you say you're going to do something, do it if it's wrong, because a man's word is his own, man or woman's word, but in his case, he was talking to me. Part of leadership we haven't mentioned, which is integrity. So, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question for the uh, The current uh, crisis of uh, leading to anti capitalist uh, protests around the world. Uh, what should uh, business leaders do uh, to ensure a fairer uh, distribution, not as a wealth, not only as wealth, but for opportunity? To Thank you. That's an excellent question. You know, I've always been very concerned about the world that we have built because actually in a population of 7 billion you have 1 billion people that are enjoying the benefits of the last few hundred years. You still have 3 billion people that live on less than $1 a day who are frankly uh, suffering tremendously because of the inequity and at the same time they are seeing every day on their television screens the way that 1 billion people are living. So I think it's a huge problem that we're facing. I think these little signs of economic crisis where really unbridled greed, lack of proper regulation and oversight led to a problem in one part of the world which had a catastrophic, catastrophic effect across the world. I think it's a failure of leadership. I think that is the core, failure of leadership. And I think that if we all don't realize that we're all sitting on a big ocean liner and yes, we may be in the captain's cabin having a, a nice, uh, you know, uh, plated dinner with fantastic lobster and wines. And meanwhile, there's a hole in the other end of the liner and it's going to sink. If we don't realize that, uh, I think we all, it's really, we do our best, but your generation has to take the world as its uh, critical, uh, you need to be custodians of the world, not just of your countries. And I think it's very important to have that globalized view and to start thinking about the world issues because with 9 billion people coming onto the planet in the next 20 years or 30 years, uh, you know, huge issues of food resources, water resources, uh, in, you know, nuclear proliferation, disease, uh, epidemics, etc., etc., climate change, the challenges are enormous. And I think great leaders will be needed and will be called upon. And I'm sure will rise to the occasion to deal with these issues, but it's really a challenge, and I think you've hit on a very important point. And so, another question? Uh, my question is for Mr. Adrian Tepe. As someone who achieved public office, Can't what, what uh, advice would you give to those of us who aspire to be the leaders of tomorrow? Uh, the question yeah. was, sorry, you repeat it. Well, I was going to ask for a clarification. Okay. I, I, what we heard, I think, was um, as someone who's achieved public office, what advice do you have to leaders of the future? Is that correct? Uh, a couple things. One, uh, no matter what you aspire to do, feel very comfortable starting at the very bottom. Uh, I'll tell you a story about a friend of mine who today is the, he is the most successful and wealthy uh, African-American agent in the country. He works for William Morris Endeavor, which is essentially the firm that uh, the entourage uh, is, uh, 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 plays on HBO. Uh, he, he wanted to be a, a, a lawyer who specialized in entertainment, but he started working in the mailroom. In my career, I wanted to be a political figure who helped people. Uh, I started out volunteering on political campaigns. So I just, everybody I know who is at the top in whatever industry they did, they started out at the very bottom. So if you find yourself at the very bottom, know that anyone who has uh, gotten to a high level started there as well and worked their way up. Uh, the uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, I think, uh, being in it for the right reasons, um, the best career advice that I could give you is do something that you like to do. If you do something that you like to do, uh, you will be excited to go to work, and you will work long hours. Those are the two most in 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 important ingredients. One, to be successful 
and to be promoted and to get well paid, but two, to be happy about it. Because I've worked jobs where I, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I went to work, but I will be very honest, I was, every, the whole day I was looking at the clock, thinking, how many hours do I have left to do it? Uh, the third thing I will say, and I always say this to students, you know, you're young, you should have a great time, uh, you should spend a significant amount of your uh, life accumulating wealth or power, or both. Uh, but always keep in mind that we only have so much time here on Earth. Uh, I, what I try to look uh, to is, you know, those last days that I'm going to be here on Earth. I've always thought about those last days that I'll be here on Earth. And I think you, at that time, you look back on your life and you say, well, you know, it's, I don't think all, the, all that power will be so important there. And I don't think all of the money that you have will be so important there. But I think in, in judging your own life, you will judge yourself as successful if while you were here on Earth, you helped people. I think you will think that you are a valuable contributor if you can point to specific instances in your life when you help those who need it. And that advice I would give to someone in politics, in law, in entertainment, or anything else. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Talan. You said that uh, we, we must not give like awards for uh, for the leaders or the thinkers who, when they are alive, yeah. Uh, but uh, like this, how they, how we will motivate them for uh, giving uh, for for them to give more for their work, for their work, or for their country? Everybody heard that? Yes, yes, I do. Right. Yes, I do. Uh, I, uh, I I received something like maybe 50 or 100 awards in my life, and it never motivated me. What motivated me, my sense of achievement, that I wanted to be there. And I want to repeat again, I thank my occupier, the enemy, the Israelis, because they taught me that in order to have my vengeance, I have to prove that I am as good, if not better, than any of them. So the motivation did not come from the awards. Motivation came because I had a goal, and I didn't wait for the award. I, I have decorations from states. I have awards from international organizations. I am grateful. I appreciate it. But that was not what motivated me. What motivated me was the goal I worked for, and I'm working for, and I still work for, and I will continue to work for until God takes his gift, which is life. Can I add? Sir, yeah. um, I think it, there's always a problem. If somebody, for example, wants to, uh, to create a film or wants to make a film just because he or she wants to earn an Oscar. Um, you, you need to, to make a film because you, you are really interested in this topic. And you, you need to have a, an intrinsic interest. That means um, you don't want to go for fame or you don't want to go for, for, um, for a great image. But you have an authentic in, interest in the theme, in the, in the topic itself. And that's the only way, in my opinion, that's the only way for success. I was just going to say that I would add that uh, from my perspective, it's establishing a goal that doesn't conflict with your values. One. I have a question. Uh, this is aimed at Shiv and Talal. You, we spoke earlier about the economic crisis, and as you know, it's still spiraling, and we have protests, we have also political reform in many countries. My question to you would be as business leaders, how have you personally protected and are continuing to protect your businesses? Um, and you're both coming from very different ethnic backgrounds and working as corporations. I think, so, I'll take this first. What, what would you uh, advise startup businesses yeah. and other businesses to... I, I'm, I'm, I'm very well known for being provocative and okay. controversial. Uh, I think okay. those who know me know that. So I would like to take offense to the calling this a, 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 a global crisis. When, when Africa was dying of hunger, didn't we have a crisis? Is it only because we have a crisis now in Europe and in America that there is a global crisis and we need global solutions? 
why did we think of global solutions for the world when the West was enjoying prosperity unlimited? This is not a global crisis. This is a cycle in a historic process. Since, since creation of the world, there has been empires after empires after empires and it will continue to be so. We have to realize that now we are at a turning point. And I said, and I have it published all over, I speak a lot, I'm sure as you know you're an Arab, on the TV and in, in press and media, particularly in the Emirates, I said, I predicted in, 19, in, in, in 2008 that we are going to live with this crisis in the West for the next 10 years and that it will move from a financial crisis to a state crisis, to an economic crisis, which is based on the bankruptcy of the states rather than the bankruptcy of the companies because the governments, by rescuing the, com the governments, took over the crisis. Now this is something that we have to live. That we are historically in a changing world. It's not just today. It, the world is a process of change. And in, historically there has been these crises all over the world. When we have to remember that some 500 years ago China was 50% of the world trade. China, was, China represents what it represents. India, similarly, India is, is the giant of the future. Why should we always focus on the problem of a crisis in one continent and forget that the world is made up of five continents. If we have a problem now in two continents, three continents are not having problems. And I want you to keep this in mind. Don't listen to what you read in the press, on the TV, from public statements by the President of the United States of America or the leadership of Europe. Don't listen to them. This is not a global crisis. This is a crisis of the governments of the West because they did not manage their, their affairs properly. We do not have a crisis in the Emirates. So this is not a global crisis. We don't have a crisis in China. We don't have a crisis in India. We don't have a crisis in Brazil. We don't have a crisis in Russia. And these are countries as well. The, growth, the rate of growth in, in Africa today is the best Africa had in its history. So there is no crisis in Africa. Let us put the thing in its proper context. We have, and this has been the same. We, the Arabs, mismanaged the world when we were on top of the world for 500 years. We ruled the world, and the world doesn't like history. Unfortunately, the world forgets history when it wants. The Arabs were leading the world for five centuries. And we were the prosperity of the world. We were the leaders of the world. We were the inventors of the world. I'm sure the West has forgotten this, or chooses to forget it. But the fact is a fact. But at one point, we also messed up, and we lost our leadership. And the West took over the leadership of the world. Similarly, there is a new emerging world. And when Obama goes to China, and he makes a statement, his famous statement, I think his most important statement he ever made. And he made a lot of statements which I wish he didn't make. <laughs> but one important statement he made is he said, the, the recovery in America, in the United States of America, depends on the prosperity of China and Asia. The recovery of America depends on the prosperity of China and Asia. Which means he knows that there is prosperity in China and in Asia, and that will be a source for the recovery of the, of the United States of America. So please don't listen and don't talk to me about the global crisis. There is a crisis in the Eurozone and there is a crisis in the United States of America, but not a global crisis. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I will uh, move from that positioning to talking about the global financial crisis, <laughs> which, although we are from India, Russia, and so on, uh, the global, the, the so-called U.S. crisis, which started with the subprime mortgage crisis, which frankly we'd never heard about, we didn't know what subprime mortgages were, uh, actually had a huge effect around the world. Not to say that uh, it was uh, that you know places like India or China 
are not doing well. We're doing well for lots of other reasons. Demographics, our own GDP, our disconnectedness with the global university, population growth, education, etc., etc. However, I do think that the world is very connected today. I think that, the, you know, as they say, if uh, you know, the U.S. sneezes, the rest of the world catch, catches a cold, that is true. I think that, taking a micro perspective, our own little business, um, which is active uh, in various segments, oil and gas, mining, real estate, and so on, uh, we had, when in 2008, in September, when you know, the world fundamentally took a big hit with the U.S. financial crisis, with names such as Lehman Brothers, AIG, and all getting wiped off the map, Merrill Lynch, we all got affected. We had to fire 125 very senior management. We had to shut down three offices globally. Financing sources dried up. Uh, we had all kinds of problems that were not created because we were connected directly to the US or to Europe, but we were connected to the global financial economy, which is global. And so I would say that one needs to keep an eye, as a business person, from a micro perspective, one has to keep an eye on what's happening globally, and one has to uh, be aware that uh, something that happens in one part of the world, the Mexican peso devaluation in 94 had a huge effect in Russia, for example. Uh, you know, the Asian flu had a huge effect in the rest of the world. So I think the world is now connected significantly. This current crisis, there's talk about China's slowdown, the, pace, the, the growth GDP growth going from 9, 10% to potentially 5 or 6%. The Indian GDP numbers are out, they're at 7% compared to a 9% that we were expecting, that 2% GDP change has a huge effect on business in our countries. Now, I agree with what Talal says, that 200 years ago, India and China represented 50% of global GDP. I believe that 50 years from now, or 80 years from now, India and China will once again represent 50% of global GDP as the pendulum swings back. However, on the micro level, we can get affected. And I think it's extremely important to see the world as a connected World. May I follow up on the, uh, the other part of the question, which is what we, we need to do as businessmen? Uh, I, I run an organization which operates in 70 offices. And I give you another perspective from Sheets, but that's one experience. Mine is since, since 2008, we have been growing at the rate of 20% a year. In all of our 70 offices, including Delhi, including Shanghai, and including Moscow, and including the Arab world and other countries. Simply because our operation does not go to the West. All our offices are in the developing, the so-called previously developing world, which should not be anymore, because China and India are not developing countries. They are emerging countries, maybe that's a better term to use. Our 70 offices are in the emerging world. And in all of these emerging worlds, we have seen growth, and we have seen unprecedented growth. Why? Because we immediately in 2008, we decided that we need a restructuring and we needed to reform our policies and to adapt the needs of the Western crisis. What are we supposed to do in order to provide the service? We are a service organization. By the way, we don't do any business contracting industry, anything. We're professional services, from accounting to consulting to intellectual property. We are the largest intellectual property firm in the world, including the West, etc. So all, in all fields of our uh, professional services, we decided what does the world need at this turning point? And we did it, and we made it, and we are now in our highest curve line. Are there other questions? I... Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Farah, uh, many Arab uh, countries are uh, experiencing uh, a change in uh, politics and, uh, in, in many our countries. Uh, so for uh, new leaders, what uh, special uh, qualities do, do they need or new qualities for the new leaders in our uh, countries? I think uh, I think it was addressed to me, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, he wanted me to answer. I'm sorry. I, I, if anybody can take it, no, go ahead. That's a difficult question. If somebody wants to take it, I want to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now let me. I, I have. I, I have. Uh, I'm very outspoken, and I'm, I'm very outspoken, and I've been on, as I said, on all TV stations and press and media talking about 
the Arab Renaissance. And I said that at the base of it is rights of the people, demands of the people for democracy, for equality, for justice, and more importantly for stopping the corruption, economic corruption, more than political corruption. Because at the end of the day, give me the best democratic system, the best party system, the best everything system, and I don't have a job, and I don't have a school to send my children, and I don't have a hospital, you haven't given me anything. There, there are basic economic needs that have to be addressed. And unfortunately, our leaders have been ignoring this because they have been living on the, on the assumption that things are as usual. Things are not as usual anymore. And as I said only last week on, a, on the a, a national TV station here, that what we are seeing is a, like an epidemic. It's an epidemic, but it's a good epidemic. It's an epidemic that is moving from one country to another. Some countries and some leaders will respond to the needs on their own and ride the wave. Some leaders will not be able to respond to the needs and they will go under the wave. So I, it depends on the leadership and I, my, I'm, I'm only a citizen. I don't, have, I don't give myself the, the privilege of advising leaders. But I say that it is up to the leaders to take the decision to make the change or to suffer the consequences of not making the change. Well, I think we've run out of time. And we thank you very much for your invitation. It was our great honor and privilege to be here today. And um, we hope we see you again. Thanks very much. <laughs>